Hello, my name is Piotr Nowoyski and I'm Apache Flink committer, currently working for Ververica, the original creators of Apache Flink. Today, together with Yuan Mei, architect of Flink Engine from Alibaba. Hi, thanks. Uh, we would like to talk about the fault tolerance in Apache Flink and how can it, how can we can it, how can it change in the future. First, I will briefly explain how is Flink currently performing checkpoints and what are the strong points of the current approach, because it's currently working quite well, especially for what it was designed for. Next, me and Yuan will go for a couple of current limitations and how are we either already addressing them or how are we planning to address them in the future. So let's get started. First, let's talk about current checkpointing mechanism. The whole idea is that in order to deal with failures, Flink is periodically taking a global snapshot of state of all of the operators. When the time uh, uh, comes to trigger next checkpoint, Flink is injecting checkpoint barriers into the source operators and from there checkpoint barriers, barriers are flowing through the data channels. In order for a state of each operator to be consistent, state, uh, snapshots, uh, state snapshot is taken only once uh, an operator receives checkpoint barriers from all of the incoming channels. This is what's called Checkpointing, uh, checkpoint alignment phase. If one incoming channel receives a checkpoint barrier before the others, we have to stop reading from this channel and wait for other channels to catch up. Only then we can snapshot the state and broadcast checkpoint barriers for downstream operators. There are multiple benefits of such approach. Uh, first of all, uh, it's low overhead during normal processing uh, gives us very high throughput and no I.O. operations on the hot path per record. This also depends on the selected state backend. Uh, for example, RocksDB might induce some uh, I.O. operations on the hot path. But in the principle, uh, fault tolerance in Flink doesn't require any additional I.O. operations in the hot path per record. Also, uh, mm, uh, our fault tolerance mechanism uh, introduces only minimal latencies for re records processing. Uh, another benefits are easier upgrades as users don't have to worry about the in-flight data at all. However, this solution is not perfect. First issue that we will talk about in the detail are long checkpointing times under back pressure. Next one is failure recovery. If even a single node fails, a Flink currently usually needs to restart whole job graph, uh, whole job graph and fail over all of the nodes in the cluster. Yuan will present more details on this issue a bit, a bit later. The last two items that we will touch are what do we need in order to achieve subsequent latencies for end-to-end -end exactly once processing and how to provide subsequent subsequent uh, failover mechanisms. However, please keep in mind that all of those uh, uh, problems, uh, for, there are no silver bullets for them, uh, or at least we don't know about them. Solutions for each of these problems will have, will have to come with some trade-offs. So how can we improve checkpointing time under back pressure? Our idea uh, are unaligned checkpoints. What happens currently with, un with aligned checkpoints is that if a job is back pressured, checkpoint barriers uh, can propagate very slowly. They travel through the job graph only as fast as the buffered inflate data are being processed. This uh, causes long alignment phase, uh, phases that I mentioned before and uh, those uh, long end-to-end -end checkpoint duration. The longer duration between two checkpoints, the more records we need to reprocess in case of failure and the higher end-to-end -end latency for exactly one sync. Uh, please keep in mind, exactly one sync can commit writes only once checkpoint is completed. So end-to-end -end exactly one's latency is defined by how quickly we can complete checkpoints. With unaligned checkpoint, the core idea is to let the checkpoint barriers overtake in-flight data. When snapshotting state, if we consider the in-flight data as part of the operator state, we don't have to wait for checkpoint barriers to be aligned on the input. 
Also, in that case, we can let the checkpoint barrier overtake the output buffers as well. That means um, the in-flight data, both input and output buffers, like we can see on the slide, will have to be persisted alongside the operator state. Uh, this dramatically speed up checkpoint barrier propagation through the job graph, even if records are being processed slowly. In case of failover, those captured in-flight data will need to be reprocessed uh, before processing new data. Also, this immediately shows the trade-off of this approach compared to aligned checkpoint. We will be increasing checkpoint size, which means more I.O. operation in an exchange for quicker checkpointing. Please also keep in mind that sometimes aligned checkpoints might be faster. This basic, uh, the basic question is, is it faster to speed the da data or wait and process it? Answer to this will be uh, different depending on the user's applications uh, and uh, cluster setup. An aligned checkpoint will be faster if spilling in-flight data will be faster. On the other hand, aligned checkpoints will be faster if processing of the in-flight data is faster. Expected benefits are simple, faster and more predictable checkpointing, especially under back pressure. And as mentioned before, more frequent checkpointing means less data to reprocess after a failure and lower end-to-end -end exactly once latencies. Limitations of this approach are also pretty straightforward. In-flight data will have to be persisted somewhere, which will increase I.O. usage, which might not be very helpful if your job is already struggling with I.O. Another drawback will be increased recovery times, as job will need to reprocess persisted data first before accepting anything new. Also, there is nothing we can do if link is stuck somewhere in the user's code and this will simply slow down the propagation of checkpoint barriers, even for unaligned checkpoints. As this feature is already in the late stages of development, I can share some benchmarking results from the work in progress version. All the results that you can see here are from the same test job that consists of a couple of uh, key bytes running with parallelism around, I think, 120 on around six nodes. Normally, the job processes records very quickly as operators are doing very little load. However, it can be configured with different desired sleep time to induce more back pressure. This is what you can see on the horizontal axis, average, average sleep time per record in milliseconds. On the first graph you, graph, you can see that throughput with unaligned checkpoints has degraded by some margin. However, the slowdown is barely noticeable if any sleep time is configured. On the other hand, on the second graph, you can see how much checkpoint duration can improve when using an aligned checkpoint. Note uh, what I have already mentioned before. If your records are very quick to process, it doesn't make sense to spill them. It's better to just wait for alignment to complete, which you can see in the similar aligned and unaligned checkpoint durations in the highest throughput scenario. As always, your mileage may vary. It will depend on the things like time to process a single record, size of the record, amount of buffer, the back pressure in flight data, and target file system when you, where you want to spill the data. Current status of this feature is work in progress. Most of the code for version 9.1.0 is already merged and we are targeting Flink 1.11 release for a rollout with some follow-up improvements in Flink 1.12. You can track the progress in Flink Jira. Also, for more technical details, you can check out my more in-depth presentation from uh, Flink Forward Berlin 2019. And we are also planning to release a blog post about this feature in the following months. Uh, next topic on uh, our list is single node recovery. And Iwan will take over from here. OK. Um, thank you, Piotr. And thanks, everyone. I'm Yuan, and I'm from Alibaba. So Piotr has summarized the wonderful work we have done for the online checkpoint. And I'm going to be more focused on the side how we do the recovery. And that's what we still call a single task failure recovery. But, but, but before jumping into details, let's step back and rethink where we are heading forward in the long term. We are heading forward nowhere if we're missing a region. 
So this is a slide I've stolen from, from Stephen. Uh, you must have seen it many times in many different places and in his talk. While if not, this graph describes the spectrum of stream processing data use cases with respect to data latency requirement. Where this, this is the place that where we were born. Um, we're targeting for stream, streaming analytics when we were born. Okay, where we were born, born here, and this is our failure recovery model to support the use cases um, for streaming analytics. So we take a global snapshot, um, but in a distributed fashion, of course, and we do a global recovery, and we make sure exact one's data quality guarantee. This model has low overhead during normal operation, um, normal processing, so it can provide extreme short latency sub-second, and very efficient. However, it has relatively high overhead during recovery. I mean, recovery usually takes 10 seconds to one minute for hundreds of tasks to do a global recovery. And of course, a global recovery needs a global restart. But if you look at the spectrum today, Flink is no longer where we were born. Uh, we have diverse use cases that cover a broad range of the spectrum from batch processing, which allows hours to days of delay to event-driven applications like stateful functions that require um, within milli millisecond delay. So our photons model, but our photons model does not change that much. And so the quest question naturally comes to our mind is, um, does the Exact ones, global recovery for tolerance model still satisfies those new needs? Well, the answer is no. Different use cases have different levels of requirements for data consistency, latency, throughput, cost, and the recovery behavior. I will explain them one by one. So for data consistency, for example, machine learning cases actually can tolerate some level of data losses or duplication since their data is sampled anyway. However, a global restart and a rollback can be hard since their data pipelines usually are very large in the order of magnitude of thousands of tasks. And the second one, latency, and the third one, throughput, are easy to understand. Now, they are exactly what the use case spectrum is describing. And the fourth one, recover behavior. For some use cases, like ads recommendation, losing data or, or taking a long time to catch up is fine, but they are not fine if the whole world is seized for, for more than a couple of seconds. That actually means the whole recommendation service is halted, and that actually means a lot of money for them. And the last one, cost. That's also easy to understand. That says if we need a high level data consistency guarantee, with extremely low latency and high throughput, and also need faster recovery, we may need to pay more than we paid today. For example, we can persist the input data without reproducing them, or high frequency checkpointing, or providing a standby instances that can take over the failed instance immediately. But you do need to pay extra money or cost to, to provide these new features. Then you can see it's all actually a trade-off. We should actually allow users to have a chance to choose based on their, their needs. There is no, there actually no one single criteria of saying um, this, is the, this is a rule, right? Okay, then the next question is how we are actually going to achieve this goal. This goal is allow users to choose based on their needs. One quick answer is through non-global failure recovery. Okay, let's now see what exactly is non-global failure recovery and how we can let the users choose based on their needs in this way. First of all, let's briefly summarize what we have right now. Um, Piotr actually has already described the checkpoint mechanism at the beginning of his talk. Um, so I will just highlight four points. So the current global model needs a global snapshot to do a global recovery. That says each task test Take, takes a snapshot after finishing to process all data before a barrier B. 
and a global snapshot for Barry B is ready after all tasks finish in the snapshot for B. During recovery, all tasks are rolled back to that global snapshot and then resume processing input data from Barrier B. So it provides exactly one semantics in terms of the processing logic of each operator, of each operator is reflected exactly once with respect to the input stream. And also, it doesn't matter whether the logic of the operator is deterministic or not, since the logic of each operator is applied to the input stream in the same way, even if the logic itself is non-deterministic. One thing we all agree is that we know a global failure recovery uh, means actually a global restart cannot possibly achieve subsequent exact ones. You cannot possibly imagine loading all states and uh, reschedule tens of thousands of tasks within one second. So we all agree non-global failure recovery is the future. Then what is non-global failure recovery? In, in short, recover without all tasks rolling back, only the, the failed one restarts. Is non-global failure recovery able to achieve what we can guarantee in global failure recovery? Uh, more specifically, exactly once. So exactly once is defined here. Um, I don't want to read it again. Uh, so people um, here should uh, understand what is that. Uh, the answer is yes. Under, but, un, under certain, but under certain circumstances, uh, that is replayability. Um, replayability says that if the equivalent same set of input is consumed, the equivalent same set of output is produced. What is the equi equivalent same set of our input? Let's say if the order of record does not matter to an operating processing logic, then any permutation of the same set of data is the equivalent same set to each other. While in the other way, if the order does matter, then we cannot say they are the equivalent same set. So the right hand side of um, the, the, the right hand side actually shows the example of execution graph. The, the white node stands for a transform task which applies task transform logic and the green arrow stands for channel data. We claim that if each task transform guarantees replayability and exactly once, the entire transform also guarantees replayability and exactly once. This shows the, actually shows the transitivity of exact ones from a single transform task to a global pipeline. This is one of the foundations of why non-global failure recovery is the right way to go. The claim can be proven mathematically, but I probably cannot do it here, I'll do the proof here because time constraints and nobody is, oh, likes to hear the proof in this kind of talk. But if you're interested, we can discuss offline. Then we come to the question of how we're going to achieve non-global non failure recovery. We have roughly three problems to solve based on where we stand today. Uh, how a task restarts without rebooting the upstream and downstream nodes. How to continue the input processing after the restart. And the how to wire output to the downstream nodes. How these three problems are related to the perspective of we want users to have their own capability to choose and make their own trade-off. Um, th this is actually the involving parts. Now we are planning ahead in the concept of non-global failure recovery um, from Atomos ones, which allows a certain level of data loss um, can be used for in cases of machine learning and uh, as a recommendation to at least ones which allows data duplication somehow and used for in ad hoc content cases like writing to a key value store. And then exactly once, um, that's what, what we currently support, um, but in a global failure recovery model. Um, and then to the subsequent exactly once for event-driven applications like state, stateful functions. So in the first stage, we're going to define the interface of the scheduler and the, the, sh and the shuffle service. And to solve the scheduling problem, of non-global failure recovery. Let's restart one task without rebooting the upstream and the downstream nodes um, because 
if you can see, actually all four cases have to solve this problem no matter what. Then the second stage solves the input rewinding problem by persistent data, for example. So one thing that actually makes this problem not that easy is you cannot comparing the IO performance to native performance. In most cases, like IO performance would be much slower than the native. So the, the, the big question for us is how we can um, achieve or achieve the, the same level of normal performance, like by processing normally, um, without, without, without paying too much cost by writing data, writing the intermediate data to the persistent storage. That's actually a challenge for us. And uh, we have some ideas, um, but uh, um, we are open to questions in this part particularly. This is actually pure as shown in the, in the experiments that uh, persisting data is, my, is actually much slower in comparing to the, the, the NETI channel transition directly. And the third stage solves the problem of output duplication caused by rewinding input data. This is actually also a challenging problem as well. And there are different solutions, but the problem is how we can solve this problem without hurting latency. And the last stage, sub-second exactly once, um, there are ideas like considering channel data as part of the state or using change log to do the incremental checkpointing having a standby instance that can take over immediately after a task is failed. And Pure will actually give more details about uh, uh, how sub-second exact ones will work and some ideas uh, we're thinking of right now. So I will just stop here and hand this talk to him again. Thank you. After this, uh, we can go into a bit more detail how to achieve sub-second ex exactly ones end-to-end uh, -end latencies. Uh, but uh, and also uh, how to fail over uh, for stateful functions under one second. But for now, let's just focus on the latency problem, how to achieve under one second for exactly one's end-to-end uh, -end latency, ignoring, uh, fail uh, uh, ignoring uh, requirement for failing over in this time. What do I mean by that? I mean a requirement that records should be fully processed and committed under one second. And that's it. Starting from reading from the sources, processing records in Flink, and committing them into things again. All of that we would like to happen as quickly as possible. Flink can already process records internally in milliseconds. However, committing external side effects is what's causing the problem. As I have mentioned before, this is currently strictly dependent on the end-to-end -end checkpoint duration. What is preventing Flink from achieving this goal right now? It's simply impossible to commit state uh, uh, files from state backends, that, from any state backends, that quickly, regardless of the selected state backend. If someone wants to achieve low latencies, uh, the first thing uh, is to make sure that cluster is able to handle the expected load. So by definition, there cannot be any back pressure. If back pressure can be ignored, current network stack and aligned checkpoints would probably offer the best latencies. But uh, the idea that we will be discussing he here in a minute would also work fine with unaligned checkpoints or single node recovery with persistent communication ch channels, for example. But the problem boils down uh, with to triggering and completing checkpoints as quickly as possible. How can we achieve that? One idea is what we call change log state backend. Instead of snapshotting and persisting state backends once per checkpoint, we could try to do it continuously by writing every update to every operator state to a change log file. This is conceptually a similar idea as already implemented incremental checkpoints in Flink but with much more fidelity. A good thing is that this idea could probably be implemented as a meta wrapper around any of the existing state backends. So user could choose 
uh, change log state backend both with file system or with RocksDB, for example. As always, there would be some trade-offs. Uh, checkpoints would be much quicker as they would just uh, consist of flashing changelog file or maybe storing some offset of the chain from the changelog file. However, maintaining the changelog uh, file would affect throughput as every state update, every write, every update, every deletion would result with, with, result with an IO operation to the, in this changelog file. Also, recovery times would be impacted. They would be uh, somehow uh, slower as we would have to reprocess the change log uh, file during the recovery. So that was the gist of our idea, how to provide sub-second end-to-end exactly one's latencies. The last topic for today is how to do a failover in under a second. Let's start again uh, by defining what do we mean by that. We would like for Flink to be able to recover from a node failure under a second. And we are talking about this at the end, as uh, this feature will depend on, I think, almost all of the previous topics that we discussed uh, in, during this presentation. Currently, subsequent failover can be achieved, uh, or maybe some workaround for it can be achieved by running just two duplicated and independent Flink jobs. Uh, some Flink users are already doing it, so it can be done. If one job fails, we still have the other job to keep processing the records until the first one uh, performs full recovery. However, this requires, uh, there, this has some set of requ requirements. For example, it requires strict determinism from the user's logic and also user's code cannot depend on the re records order. Also, it's a little bit cumbersome as it requires extra tooling around Flink to glue things together. For example, reading records twice, the duplicating records on the output, or just managing both of the jobs is uh, not as easy. How could we achieve subsequent failover without those limitations and especially without the strict determinism requirement? We could use leverage previously discussed topics and we could keep hot standby nodes ready to pick up the load. For example, hot standby node in order to stay up to date would ingest state backend change log from our previous topic from the master node. In case of a node failure, we could use the single node recovery mechanism described by Yuan, specifically with persistent communication channels, to let the hot standby node take over the traffic and to immediately pick up the work from the failed node. As only once, only a single node and only one is doing the actual processing and is responsible for updating the state and state backends, we avoid problems with non-determinism. As for trade-offs, as always, there must be some certain, certain price, uh, price to pay. There are two factors that would affect throughput here. Similarly, as for subsequent latencies, we would have to keep writing the change log. However, additionally, in order to deal with non-determinism, we, when avoiding failing over the whole cluster, we also need to use persistent communication channels, which would further reduce max theoretical throughput. As we mentioned before, persisting records uh, will just incur more, more cost and slow down the job. Additionally, this would slightly increase end-to-end -end latencies because to avoid non-determinist problems, we will be forced, uh, it forces downstream operators to only process the records that were fully committed by the upstream. In another words, on each and every network exchange, we would accumulate at, uh, some extra uh, couple of uh, milliseconds of latency that we do, latencies that we do not accumulate right now in Flink. Finally, keeping hot standby nodes will not come for free. It will require some additional resources for some memory, some CPU cycles to read the state, to read the state backend change log, etc. So now for the final thoughts. I hope that you can see what I meant by fault tolerance in Flink being good for what it was designed for. 
it's fast while providing uh, good fault tolerance uh, right now. However, if you want to expand the thing to cover more use cases in the future, especially with uh, more real-time us usages, uh, with uh, more strict requirements and more stricter SLAs, we will need to provide alternative fault tolerance mechanisms, which have their, but they will come with their own associated costs. Also, it doesn't mean that we want to throw away anything with what is already implemented and then working just fine. So if you have the experience issues uh, that we mentioned today, don't worry, we will not break anything. Features that we were discussing today are all planned as optional alternatives. So your current use cases will be work working just as good as they are now. Lastly, the first two topics presented by me and Yuan uh, are currently in progress. So analyze checkpoints are expected to be initially rolled out in the next Flink release in probably in one month, uh, while the work on single node recovery is starting now. Uh, it will all, however, it will probably take more than one release uh, to complete it fully. Uh, for the latter two topics, uh, sub-second latencies and failover under one second, uh, we are also hoping to tackle them as quickly as possible, but there is no roadmap for them just yet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Piotr. Are there any questions?